Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining and welcome to today's webinar on the enterprise 5G key use cases and integrating multiple network technologies. My name is Daniel. I work at iWave in marketing, and I would also like to welcome our speakers, Dean Bubbly from Disruptive Analysis. Welcome, Dean. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. And Robin Mitchell from Ivy Wave. Welcome, Robin. Thank you, Daniel. Hi, Dean. So our speakers are going to talk about um, the main benefits of deploying 5G and when it's better to use uh, multiple network technologies. And we'll also cover the main use cases and which industries and verticals are adopting 5G the most. And we also address some challenges that come with it. And we end the session with live IDWA demo and your questions. So just before we get started, I would like to go with you to a few housekeeping items. So today's webinar is going to be recorded and you will receive the recording by email within the next few days. And I would also like to encourage you to ask your questions using the side panel and we'll answer them at the end of the session. For those questions that we won't be able to answer today, we'll get back to you by email as soon as possible. And also, if you have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate and contact sales at iwave.com and we make sure to answer you by email afterwards. So that's it from me and I'm going to hand it over to Dean. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you very much. Hi, and um, welcome to my part of the webinar. I'll probably be speaking for about 30 minutes or so. Um, so I'm an industry analyst and advisor. Um, I've spoken on various previous IB wave webinars as well as other, a lot of other public events. Um, my uh, social media uh, alter ego is Disruptive Dean that some of you may uh, already follow. And I tend to have a fairly forthright and um, sometimes contrarian view of telecoms, networking technologies, uh, and some uh, enterprise cloud and IoT domains. Uh, I've actually been following um, mobile networks for many years, and indeed my first uh, private cellular um, experience was in 2001. I saw a, a, a small cell for GSM at the time, and I've been following the evolution of private 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, and I'm also now looking at some of the issues around 6G. Um, development and evolution. I also cover quite a lot of the policy issues as well as market trends and I look at other adjacent areas around IoT, fiber, um, voice and, and uh, video communications and so on. So uh, I'm going to be talking today about a quite broad set of topics and you know, clearly um, 5G is of a huge amount of interest in enterprise as well as other sectors. Um, and you know, although I have um, you know, not succumbed to the hype, uh, in case people are wondering, um, I do think it is going to be important. And it's, I'll come back later and, and talk about what I mean by 5G and the phasing of different um, 5G releases, because 5G will come in phases. We've had it for four years, and it's still going to be evolving probably right up to the end of the decade when we start seeing 6G. Uh, and behind this from an enterprise point of view, it's, it's worth saying that, that, that no business adopts a technology just for the sake of the technology. There's always underlying drivers and the, the work that I've been doing looking at sort of business use of wireless goes right back to your know, underlying trends in business, the economy, social and political drivers and what I call mega trends. And so you know, clearly it's things like you know, industrial automation, the desire for more productivity. Um, it's health and safety of workforces, um, uh, decarbonisation, net zero and ESG, um, globalisation or in recent years perhaps deglobalisation or regionalisation or nearshore, uh, friendshore. We've obviously got a lot of issues around trade, both positive and negative, and then there's whatever's happening with the economy, inflation and so forth. And, and all of those feed through to technology changes. Obviously technology is evolving on its own uh, through R&D and continued interest in whether it's cloud, um, whether it's particular applications uh, as well as infrastructures. We're seeing this again at the moment with generative AI for example. 
But there's a whole set of sort of, if you like, foundation layer technologies, uh, and particularly in the enterprise and especially industrial sectors I'll be talking about today. There's work on digital twins, there's work on um, you know, resource optimization and, and, and productivity gains. Uh, there's a lot of you know, efforts to collect data and then eventually use what's called a closed loop approach to improving either micro scale applications on the shop floor in a factory, um, or whether that's out to um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the more macro scale um, you know, enterprise wide effect where you've got multiple operations in say different countries and entire supply chain. And so those IT trends then feed through to networking trends and they can be um, related to, we need to upload video from a quality sensor uh, on the production line through to you know, critical communications, which have not been new, but they're maybe transitioning to a new technology for uh, critical, going from critical push to talk to push to video and real time alerting. Um, it could be an industrial setting, it could be around uh, new mechanisms for um, control of uh, industrial equipment, but there's also the sort of cloud side of this and the more IT rather than OT. OT stands for operational technology, IT for information technology. And so all of these feed through to network choices and the requirements for them and as I'll discuss soon, the, the various use cases and particularly around the big debate at the moment is around public and private connectivity, whether it's delivered by a service provider, owned by the enterprise, perhaps built or outsourced to a systems integrator in various combinations. And I'll have a talk through some of the trends there, which I'm seeing. So what I would say is that you will find some, what I'll call maximalist views of 5G. And by maximalist, I will say that that's where you have the vision statements um, around um, we essentially can run everything with cellular and particularly 5G cellular, um, whether that's um, mobile broadband for user devices, whether there is in-building, um, campus-wide, IoT, humans, robots, uh, sensors, drones, etc. And, and sometimes you will find this sort of um, vision of what I'll call a monocle. Of basically anything you can imagine from uh, vehicle connections to uh, low power battery sensors um, being integrated into 5G, either on the radio network or um, through a core network that can manage the security and policy and everything else. And you know, that is, is an interesting vision, and I'll, I'll be talking about why that's not necessarily the way that you're actually going to see almost any enterprise setting. And the reason is that. You really, when we talk about enterprise, um, and particularly enterprise IT and networking, essentially everything is like a fractal. The closer you look at it, the more detail you get. So whether that's talking about an industry, whether it's talking about a specific company, or even a specific you know, business process, there is more and more detail when you double click. Um, and there's a lot more that you suddenly realize that that one application has multiple workloads, multiple endpoints, multiple users, and there's a time dimension to all of this, uh, and that mitigates against these sort of nice, easy monoculture visions. So for example, yeah, we talk a lot about verticals in the mobile and wireless industry, which to be honest is just a convenient way of saying the rest of the economy, which isn't networking. Um, and then you'll have people who are talking about verticals, whether it's you know, education, or finance, or retail, entertainment, or for example, energy and utilities. And this is not from a, if you're if you're working in you know, say, say perhaps sales and you've got a territory of a number of companies, that's a useful way of dividing up the economy. There are some companies that are obviously utility companies or energy companies, but when you actually look at what they're made up of, there are huge range diversities of physical locations, application types, um, legacy and non-legacy uh, use cases, regulatory requirements um, and stringencies for different types of connectivity. Some of them may be life critical, safety critical, some of them are, are more uh, non-real time and, and less important uh, to a degree, although they're still important enough to, to, to invest money into. And I think you know, we need to be very careful not to just fall into the trap of saying, oh, the uh, utility industry uh, can use 
um, you know, this type of, of fiber for, for this application or 5G for the other. But actually, again, when you double click on it, when you start unpacking the fractal, um, there's lots and lots of different elements within what you thought was a nice, convenient vertical like, bucket. And so, uh, using this as an example, and this is a piece of from a piece of research that I did for for IBM over a year or two ago. I was looking at wireless use cases and which one of them could be de uh, delivered, whether it's by 5G, by dedicated wireless networks, 4G in some cases, and private or public. And, and there's a whole range of different. Um, if you're not in the utility industry, quite confusing acronyms. Um, for things about around running a utility grid that require low latency, um, the sensing, the uh, push to talk and critical communications, you know, the difference between managing what are called distributed energy resources, which might be solar grid, storage facilities in new places. We're, we're moving to a world where energy grids are geographically dispersed and operationally uh, lots of more functional components, through to the fault location, or the teleprotection. Teleprotection is, is basically when you have a problem with the grid, it's isolating, or this is like also with the FLISR, isolating a problem so you don't have cascading blackouts and then ensuring that you don't damage equipment by shutting down uh, power supplies appropriately rapidly. Uh, and so well, some of these are, are what are called general purpose use cases of connectivity and others are um, very much specific to that industry or subparts of that industry. I haven't even gotten this slide, I haven't even got um, a, a bunch of things around um, the, the general purpose security cameras and you know, AR, VR training and so on. Uh, another lens to look at is um, the scale at which wireless communications is used. And this perhaps sort of determines whether public or private networks are most appropriate. Uh, and so we tend to focus when we talk about enterprise, usually at the sort of plant or an airport or a port or maybe a smart city. Um, so it's a sort of relatively localized uh, domain. But actually that is part of a much larger corporate organization where they may have offices or facilities in many countries or cities. Um, so a retailer might have thousands of branches. A uh, utility grid obviously is going to have power stations, distribution capabilities and so on. Um, warehouses, logistics, transport again will be um, distributed across a, a wide area. And for some of these companies, they go their connectivity and application requirements go outside of the bounds of the company into a supp full supply chain with their suppliers, um, their customers downstream, uh, perhaps regulators um, and other third party stakeholders, insurance companies and, and others. And at the, the opposite end of the spectrum, you've got microscopic um, layer networks where you might have an individual application in a factory or one building on a large complex. So applications, for example, it could be as, as, as um, you know, small as you know, a high-res camera pointing at a production line or a, um, a, a conveyor belt in a warehouse doing quality control inspections or sorting products into different classes, where there's an analysis done, could be on a server, the other side of the, the, other side of the building but that needs high capacity wireless with low latency over a very short distance. And I think that sometimes we tend to focus too much on one scale without realizing that there's a couple of orders of magnitude in each direction. Another important dimension, and, and this will feed into my later part of the presentation on, on multiple technologies, is whether a given uh, company or site is a greenfield or brownfield operation. Greenfield is built from scratch, um, so it doesn't have any legacy. Brownfield is where you're building additional applications or infrastructure onto an existing um, both physical site, but also IT and network infrastructure. And you might have something in the middle. So you might have a large, let's say, automotive manufacturing plant where you've got 20 different buildings, as well as the outdoor areas, where it's a mix of, of green and brown. And, and this, is, this is really important because you know, the economics of pretty much any business means that you can't always afford to throw away working equipment, working systems. It may not be possible to get the downtime to switch them off and then implement a new thing. It won't happen overnight. There's a migration period for, say, let's say a retail chain where you've got a thousand stores. You're not going to wake up one morning and switch over all thousand to the new uh, IT and network platform overnight. It'll be a phased uh, rollout. So I think that this dimension also then plays into what do you use for technologies in the interim? Um, do you have to integrate with what's already there? 
can you start with a clean sheet uh, or do you have um, various sorts of legacy and perhaps technical debt where you have applications which are dependent on particular network infrastructure types? Uh, as you can probably tell, I'm quite enjoying playing around with uh, mid-journey AI for some of these images. Uh, and if you haven't done that, I would highly recommend that it's, uh, it's certainly useful for presentations. And uh, it also gives an idea of the next generation of, uh, of some of the AI applications we're going to be using. So you know, one, one of the things that, that I think is particularly important for an enterprise point of view is that a lot of the environments are indoors or perhaps indoor, outdoor campus environments, which come with a whole range of uh, additional challenges for, for wireless connectivity, um, particularly delivery of public network services into a private enterprise setting. Um, and you know, whilst there are ways of, of providing good indoor coverage for basic capabilities using small cells, distributed antenna systems, that's perhaps not ideal for all enterprise applications, which is why we're seeing more interest in private networks and also later versions of Wi-Fi as well. And, and you know, people who follow me will realize that I, 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 I'm not a, um, a sort of sole believer in one technology, and certainly I, I see what's happening with Wi-Fi 6 and 7 uh, as having a huge role in some of these verticals. Uh, and I think that there's, there's a few other interesting dimensions here, which is the, the picture on the left is an airport. An airport has very separate sets of applications for in the ter inside the terminal, outside on the uh, well, the ramp or apron, depending on which part of the world you come from, um, hangars for maintenance, um, and perhaps a cargo terminal as well. And each of those areas has very separate requirements for wireless. They may have different infrastructures. And importantly, you've also got lots of third parties here. So you've got the, uh, the airlines, um, you've got the fuel and the catering companies, the maintenance companies, security. Uh, and all of those have to have some form of connectivity, uh, either of their own or piggybacking on what well, could be the public network or it could be a private network or it could be a, a service provider that specializes in, in, that, in that setting. Obviously, in a retail context, you've got a lot more, and also airports, you have members of the public. So your enterprise applications include the B2C uh, ones, as well as the, the pure enterprise, like you know, maybe baggage handling or um, some of the maintenance and observation tasks. So you know, what, what this implies is that we, whilst we'll probably see over the medium term tens of thousands of private networks, and um, whether they're 4G or 5G, we can discuss later on. They're going to be a very different scope and scale. Um, and we may well see many of them at the level of individual shopping malls or hotel buildings or offices or individual ports, right up to very large scale networks for rail or utility, public safety, and so on. And I think that, you know, I've seen a number of people counting. Uh, or attempting to count private networks. And, and there you run into a question of, if I have a thousand retail outlets, is it one private network or a thousand? If I have a, um, a loca each location has a, a small private network in its own. So I sort of be cautious about some of the statistics. In fact, you know, there's some legacy private cellular for 2G and 3G, uh, which needs to be factored in here as well. There's some hundreds of, or perhaps even thousands of old 2G and 3G private networks used as replacements for cordless phones uh, in certain countries, the UK and Netherlands and Japan, for example. Um, so when I start drilling into specific 5G use cases, what I'm seeing is that they can broadly be divided by what I call horizontals, and these apply in pretty much every industry. Um, there's ones which are, are, are I'm not, I've got a slide here, but it's, if you like, semi-horizontal, so that's within, say, manufacturing, but across all of the sub-verticals. And then there's very, very specific niche or vertical-specific applications. So the ones which, are, which you know, crop up again and again, pretty much without that much difference across all of the industries that I cover. First off, I would say is vehicle connectivity and cameras. And vehicle connectivity can either be on-site, um, at, a, at a factory, a manufacturing plant, or a, a port, or an airport, or it can be wide area for telematics for, say, a fleet. So that would perhaps determine whether it's a, a public or private um, deployment. Um, and some of those vehicle connections are used for um, telemetry. Some are used in th uh, for autonomous uh, connectivity. I'll talk about that in a second, or remote driving. But a lot of it is just simple connectivity to a vehicle, perhaps then with a gateway to Wi-Fi or anything else for the, the driver, uh, perhaps um, people nearby if it's field workers, 
um, uh, that might have connectivity requirements. So it could be a gateway on the vehicle. The other side of this, the, the, the other major use case is connectivity for cameras. And the cameras are particularly interesting for 5G because they are very demanding on uplink capacity. Um, and whether that is a security camera around the perimeter of a facility, whether it's the machine vision used for uh, production line quality management, um, or a lot of other camera use cases around, it could be um, where it's allowed facial recognition, it could be used for um, detection of uh, worker safety issues, such as you know, are people in wearing uh, appropriate uh, um, helmets and reflective gear. Um, there's a lot of interest in using cameras, and this is different to the normal consumer applications for 5G, where there's more downlink, things like streaming, video, social media. Um, you know, Real-time uh, analytics of uh, you know, visual images, uh, um, and, and perhaps also you know, infrared or LIDAR comes onto that category as well. Major driver of the use of 5G. They're also the, the major driver of 5G rather than 4G. Um, because of the, the you know, particularly if you've got a lot of cameras, say on a port crane, um, whether you'd be able to deliver all of that from a 4G cell uh, is debatable. Critical voice and push to talk is actually one of those things that gets overlooked. And that's perhaps because a lot of the legacy ra private radio uses you know, fairly unusual technologies to most people in the telecoms industry, things like Tetra, P25, DEX, and others. Um, and I think that, ironically, a lot of those are quite expensive, they're quite niche, some of the systems are coming to end of life, and that's a major driver for, again, certainly 4G adoption and now increasingly 5G as well. Uh, on-site fixed wireless access to um, remote buildings or structures on-site, uh, particularly on campus environments, or maybe for an oil field where you've got lots of facilities scattered over a, a few kilometres. Various classes of mobile robots and AGVs, uh, automatic guided vehicles. Some of these are indoors, some are outdoors, some go from one building to another. Um, this is a certain, and typically they will have cameras as well, so there's no sort of clean overlap, uh, clean dividing lines between these categories. Asset tracking doesn't necessarily have to be 5G or even 4G, but there's a, a growing interest in accurate positioning and certainly later versions of 5, 5G get down to the meter and then centimeter level of uh, accuracy. There are again other ways of doing that, for example with cameras and uh, artificial intelligence, but there's, there's a, a big push towards the locational aspects of 5G across everything from healthcare, you know, where are the uh, machines, where are the gas cylinders and so on on a large hospital site through to packages in a warehouse and so on. Um, AR, VR, um, also particularly, um, you know, that's used both in the training side of things, but also in the field. Um, again, depending, you know, some of those will be indoors, some will be outdoor. Um, I, I, I think that, the, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical of some of the metaverse visions, but I think some of the enterprise use cases of AR, to say a field worker being able to do hands-free work on a, it could be a power line, it could be uh, in a medical setting, is the other famous one. Um, but again, that could even be about medical training rather than a live you know, operation or something like that. But that again is very high connectivity requirements. Indoors, you're more likely to see Wi-Fi. Outdoors, it's more likely to be 5G, but there's likely to be a crossover in, in some settings as well. And the last one is, is drones. Drones often have their own proprietary wireless um, connectivity for the controller, but if you also have either regulatory requirements, particularly if they're out of line of sight, or you've got real-time video streaming, then you may well use a, a more conventional uh, cellular connection as well. Although that's got some fairly interesting implications for the network design to make sure it covers the appropriate altitudes. Uh, and the last one on the bottom of the line is sort of normal employee SIMs and phone contracts. I, I'm, I'm not clouding that, including that as a specific application. So, yeah, there's lots of different, I, I'm just going to rattle through a couple of industries just to give a, a flavour of some of the use cases. Mining has long been important for private uh, cellular, for 2G, 3G, right up to 5G. Very demanding, often in remote locations with no public network coverage, a lot of health issues, real focus on productivity. And to be honest, it's quite an affluent industry which can afford technology um, for fixing problems, uh, often with autonomy because it's uh, often had special access to licenses and spectrum uh, if it's seen to be uh, economically important to a given country. 
And again, this spans lots of areas. It's the mine themselves, which could be above ground or underground. You've got the stockpiles, massive vehicles, uh, could be railways and ports as part of the mining operation as well. So all of this has very high requirements on uh, automation, the safety monitoring, training, uh, asset tracking and security, given the um, uh, you know, risks from various um, uh, bad actors around, particularly the more uh, valuable mining assets. Um, the ones I picked out in red are the ones which are unique to mining or, or very special. So you know, things like underground ventilation management. So if you don't work in the, the mining industry, you've probably never thought of ventilation management as a, a form of IoT. But obviously, for important, there are many important reasons. Uh, in the mining sector. But also, you want to be efficient about that because it's a huge consumer of power, um, which has huge implications for the, the footprint and, and costs of operating the mine. And so, you know, real-time connectivity is, is especially important there. You know, the geotechnical monitoring, these are not your normal sensors. Essentially, you're, you're concerned about potential collapses, um, you know, potentially you know, many, many cubic meters of, of rock and the safety associations of that. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on remote control as well as autonomous uh, control of the huge vehicles, which may be 400 tons or more, which then brings its own challenges because you know, if you've got 400 tons of metal, whether it's um, a truck at a mine or a A380 at an airport, uh, that brings its own wireless design challenges as well. Manufacturing, again, lots of subsectors. I'm, I'm not going to talk through all of them. You broadly divide manufacturing between process manufacturing, which is like continual production of things like chemicals and concrete, steel, through to discrete manufacturing of individual objects, um, cars or car components, aircraft, electronics, and so on. And, and each of these sectors has its own, obviously, its own um, technology processes and automation, industrial, industrial assets, but it also has some commonality. So again, safety is an issue. Um, machine vision cuts across a lot of these sectors for improving quality, monitoring for risks, it could be for smoke or fire, use of infrared in some cases, it could be looking for um, um, the damage, uh, uh, a flaw in a welding process, you use a high def camera focused on a welding machine and you can stop it and you very uh, uh, promptly to either fix a problem or avoid wasting um, you know, expensive and valuable uh, raw materials. Um, there's also a, a, a more mundane level, the human machine interfaces, basically is the control panels uh, on a factory setting. Typically in the past, they've always been wired into individual machines or even part of the, the machine itself or panel, a digital panel on the side. These are becoming more wireless connected. Again, use of 5G, potentially use of Wi-Fi in some cases, but they are obviously critically important for um, the control of um, uh, you know, valuable processes. And so the um, operations directors will be wanting to minimize downtime and also be thinking about cybersecurity as well in terms of their choice of connectivity mechanisms. Transport, um, ports and airports are among the, and also warehouses in the logistics side are among the most important um, sectors for, uh, you know, for private networks and especially for 5G. Um, the, the port industry is one that I'm seeing uh, increasingly adopted because of the number of moving vehicles, but also the remote control of the dockside cranes with uh, either remote control or input from the cameras. Um, yeah, and, and I think that because they're a sort of uh, dynamic setting, they tend to, obviously lots of metal work, they need very careful design and, and integration of, of technologies, but they may also have quite a lot of legacy uh, technologies there as well, uh, which is uh, one of the challenges in terms of managing that environment. Um, all of these, to be honest, I've done a previous webinar on transport and I could take a whole uh, well, hour or even day on some of this. But I wanted to highlight again the diversity here. A lot of interest in warehouses because these are probably, of all of the sectors I've talked about today, the ones which are most greenfield. You know, in the last few years, um, we've had a huge amount of investment in you know, distribution because of e-commerce, all the fulfillment centers. I suppose the other category is probably gigafactories under manufacturing as well, particularly for automotive and batteries. And then in logistics, you've got some interesting use cases. We talked about automation of you know, warehouse or yard systems for rail. Um, a lot of the vehicles have uh, generate a lot of telemetry. For example, again, in you know, rail, shipping, aviation, uh, an aircraft comes onto stand and it needs to perhaps to upload several gigabytes of, of data or operational data. Uh, from the engines from the last flight, uh, as well as some some um, more 
uh, mundane things about the you know, inventory of um, onboard consumables. Another thing which is an interesting, it's not a, a mass market use case, but it's a good one to point out the type of things that 5G um, offers is software downloads. When a vehicle arrives off of a ship um, to a, a, a new country for, ex for import, um, they will need to often to update the software. Cars these days um, have many gigabytes of software. And they often will have localized software builds. They also have updates that, that are appropriate. And that's only going to get more so in the future as you move towards more um, autonomous features or eventually full autonomy. And if you imagine a, a sort of car parking lot outside the port with thousands of vehicles, how do you do delivery of several gigabytes of updates to each of those vehicles? They probably don't have access to, to Wi-Fi. Um, they do, however, likely have a SIM uh, with uh, eSIM capability to localize to each market. So a private network potentially can be used for downloading software updates to you know, recently imported vehicles, as well as when they come off the production line. Slightly different to the industrial use cases, uh, universities, also hospitals, highly important. Um, universities have a couple of interesting ones that, that are, are not typical in most other sectors. So your know, backhaul to outdoor Wi-Fi is an interesting use case for 5G. A lot of universities, have, university campuses, have people working outdoors with laptops and tablets. Um, there's people maybe uh, connecting their, from their cars as well during the pandemic in car parks and so on. So yeah, that's uh, an interesting use case I'm seeing with CBRS in the US and, uh, and, uh, and other um, private network bands around the world. Um, you've got immersive experiences important for things like medical schools um, and engineering schools. Um, another interesting one is increasingly universities have particular faculties or facilities or laboratories that are done in partnership with industry. So it might be the advanced manufacturing lab on a university campus um, um, or a medical research facility as well. So these sort of collaborative environments are very high on the list of early adopters for 5G. Sometimes they're part of government funded test beds and trial programs as well. So um, to, to go to the sort of final section. Um, no single technology can do everything. And, I, and, and here, hopefully, I've, I've sort of I've mentioned public 5G, private 5G, and Wi Fi um, quite a lot. But as well as these, there's a whole constellation of other technologies which are important in enterprise, which have been around for years. Some still getting investments, some are more legacy. Obviously, fixed networks. A lot of the private radio is particularly important in industrial settings for critical communications and often is you know, very difficult to replace because it's it, it, it is literally life critical in a lot of sectors so there's a real sort of reluctance to relinquish some of the existing things which are known to work on a shorter range you have obviously wi-fi but also things like bluetooth and thread for certain iot uh, products um industrial some some sectors have, have like proprietary industrial meshes um, for you know, dealing with complex environments with lots of metalwork, for example, in a rail yard. Um, and increasingly, we're also seeing satellite communications as well. Um, or as I haven't got low power wide area, things like LoRa on here, but that's also important for sensors uh, over wide areas too. And so what we have is multiple reasons why there might be multiple networks. Excuse me. Um, and I think here, you know, we have to sort of think about the practicalities. We can't have one network doing everything for a few different reasons. The first one is different domains. It may well be there are indoor and outdoor connectivity domains. It could be that there is a on-site and off-site if you've got a truck, for example, that comes from the public highway into a warehouse. Um, it could be that certain buildings on the campus are newer and have better infrastructure. The old ones haven't been upgraded. Network specific devices, there simply are some devices which don't have multiple radios. So you, if they're part of the same application, you need to support multiple connect to connectivity mechanisms within the same application. So you know, typically a lot of TV screens, for example, are either Ethernet or Wi-Fi. There's, as far as I know, almost no cellular capable um, major display panels, or you could probably use a USB dongle in. A lot of vehicles tend to be cellular primary, Wi-Fi tend to be, lap, uh, sorry, laptops tend to be Wi-Fi primary. Even if you've got a few cellular laptops, if people come on site, a consultant or an auditor, the chances are they won't have a cellular capable laptop. And even if they do, it might be locked down by their employer anyway. 
migration where you go from what, um, one uh, technology to another but you don't um, uh, switch over overnight. Uh, so you've got a mix and a hybrid setting uh, you know, to, uh, during the interim. Backhaul I mentioned, particularly backhaul from Wi-Fi. Bonding and, and various other ways of using multiple networks simultaneously, either for re uh, redundancy or for extra throughput, or to use some sort of traffic steering for applications. Um, there's various instances where you might have shared infrastructure. So maybe the radio isn't um, multiple technologies, but some of the assets, the power supplies, the ducts, um, the engineering resource, people, um, may well be shared across multiple technologies. And then there's also what I was saying is, is, is tools and tools and, and software that span multiple technologies, whether that's design, whether it's service assurance, whether it's testing. Um, you know, and, and I think we're seeing an increasing amount of innovation there in the multi-technology tool set space. You could argue that it's it's a prerequisite for um, overall um, the deployment of more, these more complex hybrid architectures. So the, the types of multi-technology combination that I see most often at the moment, the, the, there's a lot of different ones, but I say that the private 4G and 5G, or perhaps different iterations and phases of 5G, public 5G and private 5G is becoming a lot more important at an application level, particularly for things which are the on-site, off-site hybrid that I mentioned earlier, the person or the truck who arrives at the warehouse or the factory or the port, but then goes over the wide area. Yeah, yeah, and you need telematics and asset tracking across both. Wi-Fi and private 5G is a very common theme, uh, and we hear a lot of talk about that. Um, the, the private mobile radio is a really important one, um, you know, partly because you know, these tend to be the applications which are often the most safety critical, uh, and also because there's a requirement for um, certainty amongst some understandably conservative people within uh, th that sector that want to make sure the new thing works before uh, switching off the old thing. And various other combinations, uh, I, I, I'm not going to go through each individual one, satellites are getting more important than the low power wide area. So 5G, uh, I've already mentioned, you know, th th this is going to be an issue, interesting issue when you talk about multiple technologies, you, we're going to start having multiple 5G generations on one site or on, in one network. This is already being an issue for the public operators where they're trying to work out how to move to 5G standalone whilst they've still got millions of users using non-standalone and what the transition between those is, how do they deal with a sort of hybrid environment. They also have a lot of 4G only customers. And that's also the case in enterprise where there's a lot of 4G networks that have been, been deployed for many years um, they are now going to be upgraded to 5G, either perhaps um, uh, standalone release 15 or 16, uh, and then the, some of the, the, the higher end features like low latency and, and precise positioning with later versions as well. So I think there's going to be a, a huge set of issues around managing the network, whether they're using the same spectrum bands or different bands, um, or whether they have to be overlay networks with perhaps convergence more at some sort of management tier. I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to finish off the last couple of slides and then we can, we can look at questions later. 5G and Wi-Fi, or 4G and Wi-Fi. Um, you know, my belief is that a lot of sites and buildings are going to need both. They're going to need continued evolution of cellular, whether that's public or private, and continued evolution of Wi-Fi through 6, 6C, 7 uh, and beyond. There are certainly devices that are optimized for certain ones. You simply cannot get 5G capable um, certain classes of IoT product, they don't exist at the moment. But also Wi-Fi has a huge install base and importantly, uh, most enterprises have 5G staff and capable engineers to a degree they don't currently have on cellular. So there's going to be a, a, a strong rationale um, for keeping Wi-Fi in a lot of places, certainly for things like laptops, but also integrated into industrial systems. And there's a number of vendors of industrial systems that, that essentially use the right connectivity for the job. Or maybe if it, if it doesn't move, use fiber. If it moves occasionally, use Wi-Fi. If it moves a lot, use cellular. Might be a, a, a sort of a, a crude metric for this. But I think we also see various forms of convergence, but also combination. And I think if you look at some sectors, I don't know, maybe say hospitality and hotels, um, their Wi-Fi in a hotel may well be on a two or three year upgrade cycle because their guests expect it. Whereas if they have a private cellular network for, let's say it's a resort and they've got it connected their uh, golf carts or outdoor cameras or something, that may have a longer time cycle, which then may mean that the investment 
and business case cycles are out of phase, which may mean that they run two networks in parallel rather than converging. And so just to, to, final, to finalize, it's, 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 you know, I focus on the networking side here, the, the network, and I put networks in plural as well, designing them, integrating, operating, and they can be converged. And so there's a lot of discussion of network convergence into a 3GPP core. I think that's going to be important in some context, but I think it's also a bit overhyped. I think we'll see other combinations, either which are kept separate or um, entirely because it's maybe run by two different teams, or they're linked in software, or perhaps um, you, know, you have different sets of credentials uh, on the device, and also different footprints. It may well be that it's an indoor-outdoor split, or a building A versus building B. And I think that, that depending on the sector and the application use case, there's not going to be an obvious, consistent, and predictable pattern here. I think it's going to be very much down to the integrator and the enterprise to understand what the application demand looks like and the costs of the network and different countries and different locations will have access to the spectrum suitable for private 5G, others will not. What I haven't talked about on this because obviously the audience and, and obviously IB web not so much involved in that is some of the higher layers of the management of multiple technologies. And yeah, I do want to acknowledge the fact that there's a, there's a huge device management and device, device selection and deployment challenge here. Um, as I said before, not all devices support all radios or all frequencies. So there's going to be some um, uh, hard choices to be made there. The security, identity and authentication layer is super important uh, and then also application management um, and assurance and, and finally the people processes uh, and finance and uh, uh, obviously play into the decision of, of how this goes. The cycle times and the phasing I think is important because that can sometimes mean that the convergence visions are not as easy to achieve uh, in reality as they are on PowerPoint. And I, I realize I've been throwing PowerPoint at you for a while. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll end and I'll hand back over to uh, Daniel and to Robin. Thank you, Dean. That was a lot of good information. I'm glad we captured all of that. And so I'm looking forward to uh, being able to share. Uh, let's make sure I'm sharing the correct screen. There we go. So I'm looking forward to being able to share some detail about our new solutions that will em enhance the design and capability of the enterprise sector. So what I uh, make sure that is coming up. I believe you should be able to see my screen. Okay, very good. So when it comes to the design, test, deploy, and manage all of your private networks in one solution, as Dean mentioned, there are multi-layered technologies in the enterprise space that will add a, uh, with each technology adds another layer of complexity. And being able to keep all of those technologies in one solution, uh, being able to provide the accuracy needed to design not only your Wi-Fi, but private LTE and 4G and 5G, but as uh, that breaks down to CBRS for 3.5 gigahertz, as well as other technologies that may be in part of that venue, uh, the complexity only grows as each year the new enhancements come and adding the different uh, enhancements for the latest technology, but also having the need to still manage the design for legacy equipment that's been deployed already at that venue. And then being able to take account for what does that look like in the real realm of that venue, not just from the design perspective, but from survey data capture with Wi-Fi and cellular, being able to do that simultaneously gives uh, the confidence that not only the design engineer, but the venue owner needs to be able to continue to grow that technology in the venue. And next, uh, you don't want to lose sight of the flexibility of those tools required to, as technology grows, to be able to add on that additional technology and licensing acquired uh, for that, the, the tools needed to for the design as well as the survey capabilities. So you, you definitely don't want to pay for something you're not using. So being able to pay for what you need along the growth process will be key. Now, our suite of solutions give you the control you need to confidently design and survey and uh, manage that network going forward. Or one of our solutions uh, provides the capability for surveying, but not only that, the design capability allows you to uh, link those two platforms together. So when it comes to private networks, whether it's Wi-Fi, CBRS, LTE, 
4G, 5G, and IoT. Uh, we are able to capture all of those in your design process, as well as as you continue to grow that technology. Being able to capture that with a survey solution for both cellular and Wi-Fi gives you that uh, awareness that you need to be able to appropriately make adjustments to the design as you move forward and grow that technology. And then being able to see that design in a 3D architecture uh, it only enhances your awareness, your visibility, your confidence in the design that you've created. Then finally, streamlining the indoor and outdoor uh, portions of that design, because many campus environments, as Dean mentioned, you have uh, a container yard or uh, vehicles coming into the facility, and you need to be able to manage the network outside that venue as well. So in those type of campus environments, being able to see both areas in a clear and concise manner will help you have the confidence you need to move forward as technology grows. And then digitizing the, the, that documentation of that design, being able to capture that detail needed, not only for your initial design, but as you add on technology, how will that impact your current design and routing of equipment, cabling, and the like? We would love to be able to have all of that captured in one aspect. And that's where Unity, our Unity platform comes into play. It is more than just a um, database, or a project repository. Uh, you can also use it for project management, being able to follow the life cycle of the project it is, as it is deployed. But not only for one location, you can manage multiple locations, uh, regardless of where they are uh, globally through uh, our Unity platform. So as projects are created, and the building is modeled, you definitely want to be able to share that data with those who will be doing the site walk in the field and getting gaining that preliminary data collection, whether it's Wi-Fi or cellular or both, being able to capture that in a mobile platform that can be shared with the designer for that venue and accurately creating an, a plan that can be implemented and then still using the same tools to go back and verify the design and that implementation, documenting whether or not that equipment is in the right location and the necessary KPIs are achieved during the design process as you do your final site walk. And of course, in your annual maintenance, your, your, your yearly site walks to verify equipment is still where it was intended, nothing was moved, as well as the necessary KPIs that were available during your initial site walk, as well as your uh, post analysis for that, that deployment. As you see here listed, the suite of solutions that will help you attain that, although we uh, are focusing on, although we're focusing on our private networks uh, solution today, uh, you can deploy uh, multiple technologies, whether it's a uh, flagship solution, which is Design Enterprise, and incorporate our REACH solution for outdoor analysis for areas where you're concerned about terrain and clutter and a larger scale area. But you still can, sorry about that, you can still uh, manage a campus venue from uh, both our design enterprise as well as our private networks if clutter and terrain are not a concern on a smaller campus deployment. We'll look at something in our demo here shortly to, to illustrate that. And of course, we have a private safety um, solution of tools and we'll not just for the desktop, but as we mentioned, the mobile solution to capture that survey data. And one thing I, I do want to mention before I, I carry continue on is our that's on a timer, sorry about that, is a, uh, our new PRISM scanner that allows you to capture uh, scanner data for private, uh, for P25 as well as LTE, and coming very soon is 5G. And in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and dive into the demo uh, so we can uh, optimize our, our time and give you an opportunity to ask questions before we wrap up. So as I mentioned, this is a campus environment for a manufacturing uh, facility. Uh, what you see is a container yard that has multiple containers served by a Wi-Fi 
uh, network for the outdoor environment and then a warehouse or distribution center uh, with a number of uh, conveyor belts, storage material, as well as uh, large trucks bringing in and taking away material for that warehouse. And so let's just look at this in a 3D view. Uh, so to give you some uh, awareness of what this it challenges of designing for a venue like this. So you have these metal containers that are spread throughout the uh, container yard at multiple heights and with Wi-Fi APs and antennas mounted on poles to serve that area as you manage the, uh, the, the product that is being distributed there. And then for the warehouse environment, you see multiple shelving as well as, well as conveyor belts and back offices for uh, admin as well as operational needs. So with those challenges taken into account as well as those um, large trucks bringing in uh, and taking away material for that uh, warehouse, the challenge is going to be at, being able to accurately design a network that will not only serve the indoor, but also account for any outdoor impact from that Wi-Fi network. So let's zoom in to that in-building portion, and we'll focus on the in-building portion for the remainder of our time. So one of the things that uh, Dean talked about was the uh, layering of technologies and being able to manage that. If we go into our project properties, and wireless services, you'll see the different technologies that have been incorporated in this design, not only the 5G new radio for the uh, CBRS coverage and 3.5 gigahertz, but also the Wi-Fi uh, for this venue as well, taking into account 6 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, uh, I believe we've got some 2.4, and including the outdoor network as well. So the challenges of all of those the different networks uh, serving this campus uh, have to be taken into account as you create the most accurate design for that venue. Uh, one of the things that I would like to mention here before we go any further is our propagation model used for this is um, takes into account, uh, it's fast rate tracing, it takes into account not only line of sight but non-line of sight as well as uh, diffractions and refractions. All those need to be taken into, into account to provide an accurate design for your venue. So as we uh, quickly look at the coverage from our Wi-Fi network and the number of AP serving the venue, and we'll focus mainly on the uh, uh, warehouse floor, you'll see the coverage is uh, serving this area. And let's zoom out just a little bit so I can bring in, there it is, my legend. And so designing for a Wi-Fi network, your target RSSI is going to be NIC 65. And as you can see, the floor of the warehouse is uh, thoroughly covered. But when it comes to um, CBRS, that LTE and, and 5G service, you won't need as many small cells as you do APs to serve the same area to meet those target KPIs and thresholds. So as I scroll up to pull in my 3.5, we'll see the signal strength for that same area, but NEG85 is the target signal strength for LTE and 5G for uh, the same service area. But we don't want to use uh, signal strength or RSSI for our target signal. We want to use RSRP would be the equivalent for that coverage. And so you see that the floor of the venue serve with uh, almost a third of the same uh, small cells serving the same area still captures the coverage required. So the, going forward, and I want to make sure I leave time for questions, uh, we'll jump right into the uh, maximum achievable data rate. So for the maximum achievable data rate for that 5G gigahertz service for Wi-Fi, you see it tops out at 123 megahertz at 83 88% of the venue. But if we look at the match for this same area, uh, you see the maximum tubal data rate is 192 megahertz, but you see not only the adequate coverage among the floor and 
being able to add um, small cells will be a whole lot easier to deploy uh, because you don't need as many and they, it covers further uh, than you would with an AP in the same venue. So the challenge is that uh, you have in many warehouse facilities uh, that uh, you may not have in other office type areas is because you may have handheld scanners that operate on 2.4 gigahertz and are not capable of uh, taking advantage of the newer technology. But with automated equipment serving the same facility, uh, you would want to take advantage of the higher throughput as well as the lower latency that Dean uh, talked about so, uh, so in, in such detail in his presentation are requirements for that same area. And one of the things I do want to mention is in upcoming releases, uh, upcoming release, you, we will allow you to take advantage of our automatic placement solution that uh, helps you with automatic, uh, not only AP placement, but also small cell placement. And we will have in the upcoming release, uh, faster prediction times, and we're excited about that. You'll be hearing more about that in the coming days, and as well as the ability to uh, manage the parameters for not only FR1, which is uh, that frequency range for sub six gigahertz, but also FR2 for millimeter wave. And so with that being said, I want to uh, allow us to have time for our, our question and answer. But I believe, uh, Daniel, I, I'll pass it back to you because I want to make sure we get some of those questions answered. Sure. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Dean. Excellent presentation. And uh, yeah, let's jump right to the questions now. And there's one question from Hassan. He's asking how to manage interoperability between the different 4G, 5G, and Wi-Fi 6 technologies in the same location. Is there an impact to be considered during the cohabitation of these technologies? Um, yes, I mean, I mean, to be honest, it, it very much depends on the application, as I, as I was saying. I mean, you know, most networks will have Wi-Fi around as well. The question is whether they are actually integrated or run separately, and if they're, if they're integrated, whether they're tightly coupled. So, for example, you've got some devices on one network or some on the other. Or the other scenario is where you've got a device which switches from one network to the other, for example, a robot or AGV, as it goes outside the building on into the outdoor area. I would say that at the moment, those um, uh, examples are relatively rare. And at the moment, we're probably more likely to see you know, some devices on one and some on the other because you've got, you've got to think about not just the network layer, but all the IP layer and the security, how you do, whether, whether you use SIMs in the Wi-Fi devices, whether you have to sort of marry together SIM-based authentication with some sort of token. Um, yeah, th there's no easy answer, but there certainly are a growing number of, of domains where you will have both. The other more common one here is, for example, where you've got a gateway on a vehicle or a small building. So you have 4 5G to the vehicle, and then like a bubble of Wi-Fi for maybe the handhelds or the communications with the uh, a personal device inside the vehicle. So it's sort of there, it's like two stage rather than parallel. All right, thank you, Dean. Uh, next question is from Michael. He's asking, you said the expected RSL for LTE is 85 dBm. Is it for RSSI or RSRP? Uh, great question, that would be RSRP. All right, thank you, Robin. And there is one more question from Russia. And how do the use cases differ from consumer-oriented applications of 5G? I was well, for, for consumer 5G, the main use cases are you know, smartphone connectivity. So for the same things you use 4G on a smartphone, broadly speaking, and so today, or fixed wireless access. So fixed wireless access is pretty similar. For smartphone use for enterprise, there's very few things that are really demanding of 5G for smartphone applications. Most video applications work fine on 4G. Um, I'd say the enterprise ones, uh, in later versions of 5G, especially where you get the low latency um, capabilities, and you know, there's, there's various other things I didn't talk about, like network slicing, the stuff you can do in the core to prioritize certain applications. 
arguably you'll see that as first in the enterprise rather than the consumer space because it's more of a, um, a more controlled end-to-end -end environment. You know, often for service providers, uh, it's difficult to determine exactly what device, what operating system version, what applications and so on that the consumer has got. In an enterprise, it's much easier to lock down a device so that firstly, it's, it's just on 5G rather than on local Wi-Fi, but also you can engineer the network in your facility to be 5G only, for example. In some cases, they always have to be 5G only because there's no 4G equipment for the frequencies available. Thanks, Robin, I don't know things on that. All right, so we are at the top of the hour, so we won't be able to answer any more questions, unfortunately. But if you have more after the session, please uh, reach out to sales at iBWave.com or any of us, and we'll make sure to get back to you. And just very briefly, as you can see on the screen, um, I would like to mention the iBWave certification and training for those that want to further develop their knowledge about wireless networks or master our tools so you can access all our certifications and modules standalone and free courses at waverunners platform which is community.ibwave.com slash certifications and we in fact have a few new certifications and courses one of them being ibwave breach and this is for our tool for designing outdoor campus networks and we hosting a virtual class at the end of june june 27th to 29th so definitely check that out. And uh, the other new certification is IBWA Private Networks, which is an online certification. So you can register for that one at any time. And a new course on the fundamental of private networks is also available. And this is just a short 30 minute course for anyone who's interested in uh, private LTE, 5G and Wi-Fi. So visit our Wavefronts platform. There's a lot of good content. So I'm sure that's uh, going to help you if you want to master our tools or learn more. And that's all from us. So thank you very much, uh, Dean and Robin, for your presentations. And thank you, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.